this morning, would you turn to Acts chapter 20? Thank you, Tony and Addie, and all who lead in worship and in music. If you've been with us, we've been on a long journey uh, through Paul's three missionary journeys. And we're coming near the close of the third of the three, and we're going to begin reading in just a moment. And Acts chapter 20, be reading verses 1 through 16. As you're turning there, over the years, I have had a number of mentors, spiritual mentors, who have poured into my life. In fact, uh, for the most part, these men have been older than I, more experienced in the Christian faith. And I have been very intentional in seasons of my life of seeking this particular aspect of ministry out. The development of these relationships is very important to me. And each of these men uh, that I actually have gone to and asked to mentor me um, is distinct, distinct in personalities, distinct in ministries and various gifts. And in fact, as I seek to add a mentor um, in a particular area, I look for features maybe that are not in other mentors that I've had so that I can get a balanced guidance in that. Some of my mentors have gone on to be with the Lord. God just planted Dr. Bill Tomlinson and Jane here for a brief season. And um, I used to laugh. I'd be knocking on that door. And Jane's probably saying, oh, here's Rick again. He's got to get some advice from Bill. And Dr. Bill Tomlinson was always ready to give encouragement. He's a great student of the Word. So if I was struggling over a text and just wanting to bounce what it meant, I could just pick up the phone or go by and visit and say, hey, will you look over this the next day or two? Tell me what you think about it. Then another mentor I've had was Pastor Willie Green. And Pastor Willie, years ago, I was going through sort of a downtime in ministry. It's probably been over 20 years ago. And my wife, Karen, said, you really need a, a mentor. And God, at that time, had put a dear friend of my father's across my path, uh, Pastor Willie Green. And a lot of y'all know him. He really... Um, increased my love for the study of the Old Testament. That's something he contributed to me. And, and more than anything, when Pastor Willie went through difficulties, and uh, I was talking with a friend, Fred Krushwitz, the other day, Pastor Willie never had very much money, but God always took care of him. But whenever you saw Pastor Willie, there was always a smile. I went to visit him. Actually, the day that he passed, I arrived about one hour after he had passed. But the last time I saw him, as he was uh, dying from uh, the results of prostate cancer, there was a big smile on his face with everything going. And I always am encouraged to persevere through difficulty as I think about Pastor Willie. But along with these men, I have mentors who are currently accessible to me, and three specifically. One has been with me a very long time, Dr. Gene Mims, another friend of my father's that I've known for a number of years. Dr. Mims is integral as an instrument of God. I thought I was going to be a basketball coach. That's my plan and my desire uh, that I had when I was young. And I remember sitting one Thanksgiving, he was in visiting with his parents, and he said, Rick, you need to come out and experience ministry. And, and he said, I believe God I will show you. And sure enough, I arrived, I worked, I felt a passion for the ministry. That summer I responded to God's full-time call to ministry. And Dr. Mims is important to me even today. If I have major issues, he's the first one on my dial uh, that I will talk with. Then there's another gentleman, uh, Pastor Ben Lehman, who recently retired from official ministry, but now he's an Uber driver and he has a captive audience. He will witness to a signpost. And uh, so he did not retire from ministry. He retired from the pastorate. And I called him one day. He said, Rick, I've already witnessed to 10 people today and they can't get out of my car until <laughs> I let them out. Um, Pastor Ben was significant with Johnny. I can remember us visiting Johnny a number of years ago. Pastor Ben discipled me in personal evangelism. He is a 100% jacked up, motivated believer. So if I ever get need encouragement, or exhortation, uh, I'm going to call Pastor Ben. But most recently I've was led of the Lord. This has been in the last month to contact another gentleman in the area. As I said, Dr. Bill Tomlinson passed away a few years ago here in the past year, Pastor Willie Green. And I contacted a gentleman 
named Robert Wilson, his daughter, Lori Gott, we just mentioned it, passed away. And um, Pastor Wilson is a dear servant of the Lord, probably has the greatest pastor's heart I've ever met, humble service. Years ago, when I was young and playing ball, it was a torrential downpour. I'd gone up to IMAX, played basketball, got in the car, stopped by a convenience store, was going to pick up a soft drink. And there I see Pastor Wilson drenched. I mean, didn't have an umbrella or anything. I said, Pastor Wilson, where you been? He said, I've been out knocking on doors. And I felt convicted of the Holy Spirit this servant of the Lord. What a gentle man. And, and now in his retirement, something very unusual has happened. He's gone back to Evergreen Baptist Church and in his 70s is serving as an associate pastor under someone else. How many people would do that? That tells you the type of man that he is. And, and I needed somebody nearby that can provide that type of counsel. And so mentors have been very important in my life. I hope that you have mentors. I hope that you have individuals that you can call upon uh, that can encourage you. Uh, I have a ministry theme verse that's related to mentoring. You've heard it before. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. Remember your leaders have spoken, who have spoken God's word to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Now, I don't have time to parse out that verse, but I challenge you to take it section by section. Allow it to speak to you, and it did. Remembering observing and putting into practice. And that's what I desire. As I look at the various attributes of those God ha has placed as my spiritual mentors, that's my desire. You know, God is good. He puts such people in our lives, but he does that and more because he gives us not only these people in our lives, in, in our, our contemporaries, but he also gives us figures in the Bible that set great examples for us. And one of those is the Apostle Paul. And even though I have not seen the Apostle Paul with my eyes nor talked with him, I can read the historical accounts. I can read his teachings and, and God works through his life in my life. And so today, as he nears the end of his third missionary journey, we're going to look at, at some significant things. And I want to look at four marks of a good minister. Look with me in, in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. After the uproar was over, what was that uproar? You remember last week there was a stir in believers and unbelievers who respected Paul, even a city official, a clerk, uh, allowed Paul to come through that unharmed. But after that uproar was over, here he was in Ephesus. Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them after saying farewell, he departed to go to Macedonia. He's leaving Ephesus. And when he had passed through those areas and offered them many words of encouragement, he came to Greece and stayed three months. The Jews plotted against him when he was about to set sail for Syria. And so he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus, from Berea, Aristarchus, and Segundus from Thessalonica, Gaius, from Derby, Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus, from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In five days we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking. When he was overcome by sleep, uh, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, embraced him, and said, Do not be alarmed because he's alive. After going upstairs, breaking the bread and eating, Paul talked a long time until dawn. Then he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assas, where we were going to take Paul on board because these were his instructions since he himself was going by land. When he met us at Assas, we took him on board and went on to Mytilene. Sailing from there, the next day we arrived off Chios. 
The following day, we crossed over to Samos, and the day after, we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. Let's pray. Fathers, we open your word today. We pray that we would glean from this narrative the truths that were evident in Paul's life and that we would not only observe and take note, as the word tells us in Hebrews, but to seek to imitate them. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there is so much that we can learn from the Apostle Paul. I've often said that if I were a, a law school instructor, and I'm not close to that, but I would require the study of the book of Romans and the study of the book of Galatians, because to me, in a brilliant form, defending the faith, presenting the faith, Paul does that. I mean, he was outstanding. As you think about Paul, not only his teaching, but just his perseverance through ministry. You think about the times that he went through, the difficulties, uh, the struggles that he had, the, the physical uh, maladies that faced him and how he continued to press forward. I think about he was always ready to share a testimony. Uh, later in the book of Acts, we see twice in Acts 22 and 26, he shares clear testimony of the Lord. In his epistles, he gives testimonies. He's a great example to us in that. And, and then just the person that he was. He, he had a boldness. He had a conviction. He was a great example of what it means to be a Christian. But, and there's so much we can look at in regard to Paul. But today in our text, I want to note four things that we can gain from studying Paul's life here. And, and, and it's really words to the minister. I almost hesitate to use the word minister because you might tend to check out, okay, it's a professional minister. And I'm talking about any person who desires to follow Christ. I think there are four things that we can glean from Paul that are important here today. And the first is this, Paul sought out close fellowship with select individuals. Now chapter 20 begins by telling us that the uproar we studied last week was over. After that, Paul felt like his time, which had been three years in Ephesus, had come to a conclusion. He felt led, as we saw last week, to gather that offering that was collected from Macedonia and Achaia and make his way back to Jerusalem. And so early here in chapter 20, he is giving his goodbyes and his farewells to those in Ephesus. The scripture says that he leaves for Greece, where he stayed for three months, and then his intent from there was to set sail to Syria and make his way down to Jerusalem. But there were Jews who were still chasing him. And so he felt threatened. In a very interesting way, he, he took a circuitous and very long roundabout way to make it to Jerusalem. It must have been very clear to him that his life was threatened because instead of sailing a direct line to Syria, the scripture says he goes back around through Macedonia, back around and heading down that particular way. But I don't want to focus so much on the journey that he took. I want to focus for just a couple of moments on those who traveled with him. We see eight people included here. Luke would be one of them. This is part of what's called in the book of Acts, the we sections. Luke is writing Acts. There are times when he speaks in uh, the uh, third person, like he went out, they went out. But then there are times when he spoke in the first person plural. And that meant that during this part of the journey, Luke was with uh, Paul. But not only Luke, but we see seven other individuals from different areas that Paul had, met, had visited during his three missionary journeys had joined them. And what we learn from this is that Paul was not just about large gatherings like this. It was not just those things that fueled him, but Paul was investing in individuals in small groups. And I picture as they're traveling the dialogue that's going on among Paul and these eight members who were traveling with him. And really, as I was thinking about it this week, uh, why did Paul just 
include these select individuals. And really, I think there's a simple twofold reason. Now, there may be more specific, but I'm just speaking generally here. And I think the way I can illustrate it is by sharing a family illustration of my maternal grandmother. Uh, Bobby Showalter back there will remember my granddad. Uh, and on Saturdays, my granddad would come by, Bobby said, and visit him at the shop. And my grandmother would travel and go to Roses or whatever. There was a reason that my grandmother traveled a lot with my granddad when he wasn't working. My grandmother was afraid to be alone. That she was adopted as an infant, a preacher in Pamplin, saw a couple in Evergreen and said, I've got a cute little baby with brown eyes that doesn't have a home. Uh, there wasn't a formal way of adopting. They just took her in a as a foster child. But my mother, who had a much older sibling uh, that lived and, and passed away in Cumberland County, was always a fearful person. She did not like to be alone. Enter a lady named Grandma Snell. We called her Grandma Snell. She was no kin to us. She was a spinster. She'd never married. She taught in Brook Neal for a number of years. Uh, she had one sister who was working that could not keep her. And so my grandmother kept Grandma Snell. Grandma Snell to me was an imposing figure. I don't know how tall she was. I was about seven or eight. She seemed to be about six foot eight. I mean, she was a tall lady. Uh, she was stone deaf. She could not hear any. And, and, and she would try to audibleize words and it would be muffled and it would be very loud. It was before you had the intricate uh, detail of hearing aids today. And I love Grandma Snell, but I had to get adjusted to her, her voice. And so she just became part of our family. She was no kin. And so when I would go visit Nanny during the day, Pop would be at work. There was Grandma Snell. She would be sitting there. And I'm thinking, to my, uh, you know, as I'm older, now, now Nanny, Grandma Snell, couldn't help you. She was 80 some years old. She couldn't hear if anybody came in the house. But just having someone there was important. And, and it was only when I was an adult that I realized the twofold blessing that was happening in this situation. One, Grandma Snell needed my nanny. She had no family to take care of her, and so my nanny was like a surrogate daughter to her and took care of her. The second was this, my nanny needed Grandma Snell. She didn't like to be alone. And so there was a twofold blessing. So as we look at Paul here, as he's traveling with this, this group of eight individuals, it was a both hand. They needed Paul. Paul was traveling with them, and, and and as a mentor to them, he was pouring into them and instructing them because they wouldn't be traveling with him forever. They needed that instruction. But in the same way, it encouraged Paul. You know, we saw last week how believers right there in Ephesus, they were around Paul and they said, oh, now wait a minute here. There's a, a riot. Don't get in the middle of it. So we see a twofold blessing. As we look at Paul's life, we need the fellowship of believers. We're not called to live the Christian life in, in isolation. E every one of us, we need a Paul. We need someone that we can talk to, that can encourage, that can strengthen us. And, and many of us, as we grow in the faith, we're called to be, uh, we, we're, we need Timothys in our lives. We're called to be a Paul to someone else, to pour ourselves into them. So it's important. The, the, it's important that we have those close relationships where we can, can, can glean things from, where we can share. So Paul had a small company that he kept with him. I individual involvement with believers was important. But I want you to see a second thing. The public gathering was important. It, it was important to him to have a few select and trusted uh, brothers in Christ who were with him. But the corporate gatherings were also important. So as he goes through the travels, we see he sends some of the men ahead to Troas. And after a few days, he catches up with them and he stays there in Troas for about a week. And, and, and it says there that the first thing that he did upon arriving at Troas was he met 
on the first day of the week with individuals. Last Sunday uh, in Sunday school, and this has been a great series of messages on the church. And last week uh, we talked about the corporate gathering of corporate worship, of corporate prayer, how the Christian life is not in isolation. I, I was in part of the lesson today as John was teaching again that we're members of one body and, and how we work together. And, and the scripture is teaching us in Sunday school the importance of that. Paul considered it important. Now think about Paul for a moment. He was a strong man. He was a man of strong countenance. He had strong convictions. He had a John Wayne type of personality, but he still needed other believers. You did not see him forsake the gathering of himself to other believers. And it was not just so that he could minister to them, but he needed them. Throughout his journeys, we see the first thing that he did is he appeared in the synagogues. He appeared in the places of Jewish worship. Why was that? Because he could go where there were God-fearers. He could communicate the gospel. There would be reading. There would be singing. Even as we're blessed, the teaching of the scripture, uh, the expositional um, uh, presentation of the word, and there was mutual edification. Now, if Paul sought this out first when he went into a new territory, how much more do you and I need the public gathering? We're going to look at the miracle that happened here in a moment. But before we do that, I want you to see that there was a time that they met on the first day of the week we assembled. And not only was there a time, there was a practice now, now, it says that they broke bread, which is representative of the Lord's Supper. Now, we as Baptists do this about once a quarter. And to be honest, we probably should do it more often. Uh, some churches do it every week. Maybe there's a balance somewhere between. But we see the importance of the breaking of the bread. What was that? A visual presentation of the gospel. But also there was preaching and teaching. There was dialogue, as, it, as we saw last week, where the word was expounded, where where people were studying the word and they were growing in it. And so through the Lord's Supper, there was the visible presentation of the gospel and through uh, the preaching and teaching, there was the audible expression of it. And so we see both. But, but, but we see in these first two things, Paul considered it important to have a few close friends that challenged him, that encouraged him, that he could pour into. He saw it important that there would be that he would be involved in larger gatherings. But a third thing we see about Paul, in his ministry, he issued a demonstration of the miraculous. And we see that again here. You know, in certain seasons, um, my dad would sing in the choir. My dad had a good voice, like uh, he, he didn't read music, and, uh, but he could hear a song and, and pick up with it. Um, uh, I can still hear his voice when the roll was called up yonder, whenever that was sung, and he would bellow it out, and I would shrink in my seat because I was embarrassed because he was so loud, but he loved to sing. So he sang in the choir for certain seasons, and we have our choir, but uh, when we finish with our singing, we, we come back down and, and sit in the front. Uh, but most of the years, my dad was in the choir. Their, their choir stayed behind the pastor, which meant everybody could see him. And my dad sometimes would, as he said, rest his eyes. We said, Dad, we caught you sleeping. He said, Son, I'm just resting my eyes and reflecting. I didn't have the courage to say, Okay, tell me what the preacher said while you were resting your eyes. But he was convinced. But I thought about sleeping in a choir. Maybe you get embarrassed by your children. Maybe you slump over like that. Maybe you inadvertently fall over to the side and bump the shoulder of the person next to you. There's not much harm in that. But I would not advise sitting in the third floor in a building in an open window and falling asleep. And that's what happened to Eutychus here. Eutychus was a young man, maybe even a teenager. He fell asleep. Paul had preached for a long time and he came back. Did you realize that it was about, he came back and preached even longer after somebody dropped dead at, at the result of his preaching. But, but, but this young man, Eutychus, <laughs> This young man, Eutychus, died. Paul went to him. Everybody thought he was dead, and he was raised to life. And that was a miracle again. He embraced him, verse 10 said, and he rose to life. 
Simply put, that was the power of God working through Paul's life. And we've talked about the miraculous. And there are dangers at both extremes. There's the danger of saying God doesn't do miracles anymore. Well, I can tell you that's wrong. And there's the danger of going to the other extreme of looking for a miracle happening behind every bush and every Sunday. Because if that were to happen, by very definition, it wouldn't be a miracle because a miracle is an unusual occurrence. We have talked about the importance and how we learned last week as we studied about the rich man and Lazarus as, as the rich man was in dialogue with Abraham and he said, send somebody back, send me back from the dead to my brothers, send somebody back so they'll believe. What did Abraham say? I'll do it. No, he didn't. He said, they have the law in Moses. They have the word of God. And so it's very important for us to know that we're not to be spectacle seeking when we have the very word of God in our hand. And there's power in the word of God to convict of sin and convince people of the truth. The word is more powerful than any miracle. The word can transform a life forever. It says in the scripture that, that everything passes away, but the word of God abideth forever. Now this man was raised by a miracle, but he would later Die. It wasn't a resurrection. It was a resuscitation, for lack of a better word. He was raised only to die again. He needed what the gospel could give him, which was eternal life. I like what uh, another mentor I have that I never met that's gone on to be with the Lord, but I've heard his ministries, Adrian Rogers, and we've said it before. He, he said it recently, if you followed him, believe in miracles, but trust in Jesus. Don't trust in miracles. They can come and go. Trust in Jesus. He's constant. And so whether you perform miracles or not, the thing we need to gain from Paul here, there was a power emanating through his life because he was committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would that you would pray, God, may your power be manifest through me today when we wake up in the morning. And God may not have you raise somebody from the dead, but there may be a power that is undeniable that will impact other people. Too many times we as Christians are living wimpy lives when we should be living in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, manifest your power through me. It's something to pray for yourself, for your family. And so we see that Paul... Uh, in his ministry, carried out the miraculous, the power of God was manifest. But I want you to see a final thing. Paul's ministry was priority driven. To say yes to some things, we have to say no to others. I'm learning that even in years of ministry. To be able to say yes to some things, we have to say no to others. As humans, we're limited in our strength. We can't be two places at one time. Uh, it's better to do one thing or a few things very well with great vigor than it is to try to do many things and not do them so well. The thing that impressed me about Paul throughout all of this was he stayed on point. Remember when he had, we looked a few, probably a couple of months ago, when we looked at the the, the division between him and Barnabas, man, that, that, could have, that could have been catastrophic. They, they could have just packed the, packed the tents up and said, hey, we're done. But he didn't allow that to keep him uh, from moving forward. Remember, uh, with all the opposition that he's faced when people would try to threaten him, he either just stood strong and did what he was doing, or if he had to move, he kept on with the ministry. He stayed on point. And our life's purpose should be on point. Now God's called us to various vocations, various jobs and things, but primarily we're called to be followers of Jesus Christ and what that means and how it's lived out in our life. Why do I exist? What am I to be doing? In the spiritual realm, what am I called to do, God? Too many people are living their lives in the rat race of work and, and activity and all of this. And, and 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now, you'll be deceased. What will people remember you for? I pray that you'll take very seriously to invest yourself in the things of God because they abide forever. Paul was called to evangelize and spread the gospel. 
That's what he was called to. Paul found it and he did it. That's what we're to do. What is God calling me to do? Is it in music ministry here? Is it on, in serving short-term missions? Is it financially supporting? Is it teaching? What, what is God gifted and called me to do? We find it and we do it. That's what Paul did. And, and, and we're not to be distracted by, by bad things, discouragements, things like that. Paul wasn't discouraged over an earlier division. He kept on with the task. Paul wasn't discouraged from the opposition from the Jews. He kept with the task. He wasn't affected by physical threats. He continued to carry out the task. He wasn't distracted by the bad things, but he also wasn't distracted by the good things. And we see one of those here. Look at verse 16. At this point, Paul had completed the ministry at Troas, and again, sticking to point, even when this man passed away, he didn't just say, well, that's the end of the service, see y'all, but he realized his time was only a few days in Troas compared to many years in Ephesus. He maximized the time. He stayed until sunup and continued with the task of the gospel. But then he left Tro Troas, and he was heading to Jerusalem. And look at verse 16. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. Why didn't he want to go back? Did the people there have bad breath? Were they obnoxious? He had been three years. It sounds cold, doesn't it? It sounds like Paul's the person, and, and don't get on your high horse and say you've never done this, that the person that walks into a store and sees somebody in the fifth aisle that they're trying to avoid in the grocery store, and they go to the seventh aisle. You've probably done that. You said, I don't have an hour to talk to this person, or this person, is, and we look. It's not that way with Paul. He, he sailed away from Ephesus because he was on task. He had received an offering. He wanted to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. He was carrying out evangelism and ministry, and he would not be deterred in it. He did not want to waste the time. Now, we're going to see he's going to meet the people in Ephesus at another point. Later, some select leaders there will meet him. But Paul had a task, and he would not be deterred. He lived his life on point. How are you living your life? Are you just sucking in oxygen and breathing out? Or are, are you just uh, living day to day in the daily grind without thinking? Or are you living your life in the power of God on point? That's what Paul did. You know, one thing I'm very serious about is seeking out spiritual mentors. I, I spend time on that, more time on that then I do a, a lot of things in my spiritual life. I, I'll be honest about that. Why is that so important? Because I need them. I can learn from them. I can glean things from them. Those who've gone on to be with the Lord, I, I've thought, what would they do in this situation? We need it. But God has blessed us in the scripture with individuals like Paul that we can follow just as Hebrews 13, 7, we can observe the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. What are the things that we see from Paul here? The importance of having close, select brothers or sisters for you ladies in the Lord that can encourage us in the faith. Being involved in the corporate fellowship, which means even when we don't feel good on Sunday, we get up. I, I heard the funny story that was told a wife and a husband get, get out of bed on Sunday and the wife is up and she's ready to go to the church and she's punching the husband saying, get up and let's go to church. He says, I don't want to go to church. She says, you have to go to church. You're the preacher. <laughs> God delights when we joy, enjoy and rejoice in the corporate gatherings be here. Demonstrating the third thing, the power of God. That's what we saw of Paul, wherever he went, demonstrating the power of God in his life and living that life on point, finally. Not, not being distracted. We can't do everything, 
We're to do what God's called us to do. And that way, Paul is a mentor to each of us. Let's pray. Father, um, we thank you for all that we can gain from the study of your word. And um, Lord, we thank you for the truths that we see in Paul's life. Help us to observe them, to consider them, and to seek to imitate them in our own lives. Father, if there be any here today who have yet to trust Jesus, I pray today would be that day. And Father, we give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing in just a moment hymn number 305, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Is that your desire today? Have you come to the point in your life where you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you willing to publicly profess him? He said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Would today be that day? Maybe today you've trusted in Christ. Maybe God has spoken to you in your life during this week or through the Sunday school lesson today or through the message. God's Spirit is speaking to you and you feel the importance of making a monumental decision today. However God leads, you come as we stand and sing number 305. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go Thank you so much today for being here and uh, just pray you have a great Mother's Day and uh, as we go from this place let's be resolved uh, to live for the Lord. I was just thinking as we were singing um, the great joy of serving the Lord. If you're serving the Lord with your life, if he's at the center, if you're following the example of Paul today, the best is ahead because if you die and your heart is with the Lord,